All right, we talked about blood from above. Let's talk about blood from below and talk about bloody bowel movements. So lower GI bleeding in adults. So you can have diverticular bleeding. It's typically pain bliss, but it can be massive and also really hard to find. Uh, angiodysplasia, so this is associated with hypertension, associated with aortic stenosis. It's also associated with people who have um, left ventricular cyst devices, LVADs. Uh, maybe one of the most feared is an aortoenteric fistula, right? So if you've had prior aortic surgery, you have erosion of a graft or a repair into your gut, there can be a sentinel bleed. Uh, but when this really opens up, it's really bad, and this merits prompt surgical consultation. So this next slide here, this is a great reference slide. Um, this is bacterial bloody diarrhea, and it gives you the infectious agent, and then gives you signs and symptoms um, and things to look for associated with that. What about invasive diarrhea or inflammatory diarrhea? So there's the presence of inflammation, so there'll be white blood cells in the stool and bleeding. Uh, maybe one of the most famous ones here is E. coli 157H7, right, which causes enterohemorrhagic E. coli, so there's gross blood in the stools. Famously, this is caused by uh, undercooked hamburger at fast food restaurants. It can also be associated with petting zoos, raw milk, or untreated water. In kids, this can cause hemolytic uremic syndrome or, or TTP in the elderly, and antibiotics might actually increase the risk of HUS. Uh, how about some other invasive diarrhea? So Shigella or Shigellosis is really infectious, can cause a high fever, including febrile seizures, uh, bloody mucoid diarrhea, uh, its incubation period is two to six days, and it can be treated with fluoroquinolones. Salmonella is really, really common, uh, associated with watery and mucoid stools, um, sometimes uh, improperly cared for cafeteria food. There are a number of pet reptiles and amphibians that carry salmonella. Backyard chickens, increasingly popular, associated with salmonellosis. Um, and this can cause osteomyelitis, especially in patients with sickle cell or splenectomized patients. And again, the, the first-line treatment here is fluoroquinolones. Last but not least, Campylobacter. So this is the most common cause of bacterial diarrhea. So that's very testable. Campylobacter is the most common cause of bacterial diarrhea. Usually contaminated food and water or fecal oral spread. It can give you this bloody diarrhea and fever, can mimic inflammatory bowel disease or appendicitis. Uh, in kids, this is treated with erythromycin. In adults, typically fluoroquinolones. And this is one of the infections that's associated with the development of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, how about Vibrio? So, um, Vibrio cholera um, is uh, endemic to a number of areas in uh, South Asia and elsewhere. Vibrio parahemolyticus, you get from raw oysters or clams or shrimp. Uh, that has a six to 24 hour incubation. Vibrio vulnificus, which can cause horrible sepsis, um, classically in a cirrhotic patient, again, associated with oysters or shellfish or wounds from uh, seawater or marine areas. Yersinia enterocolitica, so this is an invasive gram-negative that's found in undercooked pork. Uh, it can also mimic appendicitis. Um, it's associated with colical, uh, colicky abdominal pain in kids. It can last a long time. If it's uncomplicated in a healthy, well-nourished person, the treatment is supportive. If it's complicated, you can treat with fluoroquinolones or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. All right. So this is the acute infectious disease pathway, and this breaks it down by watery diarrhea and bloody diarrhea, um, and then you know indicates potential treatment options that you have for this. What about Crohn's disease? So Crohn's is a chronic inflammatory disease that involves the higher, entire GI tract, but it doesn't have to be contiguous, right? So the classic thing you find here is skip lesions or uh, interspersed areas of inflammation in normal bowel. Uh, causes abdominal pain, cramps, and diarrhea, which is sometimes bloody. Uh, these patients can suffer from fistulas and abscesses, rectal prolapse, toxic megacolon. Uh, increased absorption of oxalate can lead to calcium oxalate kidney stones. And they can have extra intestinal manifestations, such as arthritis or erythema nodosum or hepatobiliar disease or uveitis. So ulcerative colitis, so this is similar, you can get similar symptoms to Crohn's disease, but the difference is that this is isolated to the colon. So typically over 90% of these patients will present with bloody diarrhea. Um, as Aaron had mentioned, toxic megacolon is a, a concern. Patients can get extremely sick um, with systemic toxicity and peritonitis. Um, you can get mucosal and submucosal involvement only, so this is not full thickness of the bowel, and this can increase your risk of colon cancer 30-fold. Here's a nice chart for reference, just um, delineating the difference between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So this is a good one to search through the index.
So this slide is also a great reference slide. This is pediatric causes of GI bleeding, and it's also broken down by upper GI bleeding and lower GI bleeding. Um, so one thing that's important to think about with upper GI bleeding is um, foreign body. So in particular, right, button batteries, um, can be you know absolutely frightening and that's a thing that if you're concerned about if there's any concern at all just shoot a plain film and that can tell you if there's something in there um, also swallowed up astaxis can give you some upper gi bleeding if they can give you hematemesis and then lower gi bleed quite common in children are anal fixtures many of these kids are constipated and so um, that can certainly do it into susception is a concern there um, and hsp and then obviously don't forget about sexual abuse as well so blood and in infant stool. So what are the leading causes of blood in the stool of infants? So one thing is allergic colitis. So that can be intolerance of, of cow's milk or soy intolerance. Uh, anal fissures, again, really common with constipated little kids when their stools start to become firm. You can have transient lactose intolerance. Um, things like colitis or interception in the appropriate age group. There are some unusual theories too. So swallowed maternal blood, which should be only during the first several days of life and really should be black and not red. Uh, people again talk about swallowing of the blood from nipple while nursing. Again, it should be black because it's been digested. Um, you can have infantile vaginal bleeding, and that's from the uh, abrupt estrogen withdrawal associated with the perinatal period. If it's a single event, usually you can just watch it, and most of these cases, you don't figure out what the cause was. Okay, so what about vomiting blood in infants? So these are uh, lists other concerns, what's more likely and what's less likely. Again, as Aaron had mentioned, one of it, an important thing to ask mom about is, you know, is she nursing? And if she's nursing, does she have any cracked, uh, you know, nipples? Has she noticed any bleeding from her nipples? Or if she's pumping, does the milk look pink, right? Because those are certainly, that's one of the more common things that you can see in an infant. What about necrotizing enterocolitis? So this is really severe intestinal inflammation and then infarction, and this usually occurs in preterm ba pre babies, so these are NICU babies, but very rarely a full-term baby or a preemie will come from home with neck, and that presents as a sudden change in feeding tolerance, abdominal distension, peritonitis, vomiting, hematochesia, and these patients usually look sick. They're really shocky and really septic. So if neck is possible, you gotta do an early consultation with a pediatric surgeon, treat the patient for sepsis, cover for bacterial translocation with broad-spectrum antibiotics, Plain films will typically show dilated loops, wall edema. They may show pneumobilia. They may show pneumatosis intestinalis. Again, the treatment is surgical, so you want to give antibiotics and resuscitate, but you need a surgical consultation as soon as possible. So intussusception, this is when bowel telescopes inside itself. And so most of the time it's idiopathic, um, but about a quarter of them can have a lead point, right? A pathologic lead point. So particularly in older patients, this can be concerning, right? Because it can indicate an underlying neoplasm. Um, it is the most common GI emergency of childhood, and it's the most common cause of bowel obstruction in kids age three months to five years. So how do these kids present? They can have this intermittent severe pain, right? So we talk about when kids will draw their legs up in pain and then in, you know, and, um, in between them, they may have no pain or they can be uh, listless. So um, it can be you know, uh, intermittent. Uh, their abdomen can be non-tender. Um, they can have vomiting. You can feel kind of a palpable sausage and typically in the right upper quadrant. Um, and again, these patients can be very sick. So they can have blood stools, they can be lethargic, those are late findings. Um, definitive diagnosis, so you can do an ultrasound um, that can show you, and you can kind of see the double wall sign on the ultrasound over here. And, you know, if the diagnosis is likely, let's say they've had this before, you can go straight to um, uh, fluoroscopic enema, and this is, can also diagnose, but also treat these patients. All right, what about henox shunline purpura? I've had this a couple of times. Now they call it vasculitis A. So this commonly occurs after URI in young kids age two to 10. And the classic presentation is palpable purpura, right? So anytime you have non-palpable purpura, it's often a disorder of platelets. If you have palpable purpura, you think about a vasculitis. The classic tetrad here, a rash, arthralgias, belly pain, renal involvement. Not everybody gets all four. And this is a clinical diagnosis. So if there are palpable purpura or more than one of these tetrad uh, signs or symptoms, then you gotta think about HSP. There's often livido reticularis. Um, the abdominal pain is due to submucosal hemorrhage and edema, and that usually occurs about a week after the rash. 
that can lead to intussusception, as Jess talked about, um, can cause renal involvement and hematuria, usually self-limited, treatment generally supportive. Okay, so what about hemolytic uremic syndrome? So this is largely due to a pathogenic E. coli, and it can present with a gastroenteritis syndrome, and then five to 10 days later, you can get acute anemia, thrombocytopenia, and non-palpable purpura, as Aaron had mentioned. And then you can also get renal injury. So this is the triad that they talk about with HUS. So this is a, uh, the most common cause of acute renal failure in children, half of which are require dialysis, and kids can present really sick. So some can have seizures, they can present somnolent, and diagnosis would be a peripheral smear and a shigatoxin.